Welcome to the Beyond Biopsychosocial Training Program. My name is Jeff Hauck, and I would like to acknowledge my colleagues from George Fox University, Dr. Kang, Dr. Philbrook, Dr. Jacobson, and Dr. Cuddyford. This module, we focus on interpreting and applying the promised physical function measure to practice. The presentation answers four questions. What are some basics about the promise physical function measure that are important to remember? What are the motivations to using promise physical function in clinical care? And are the promise measures really better than our existing disease specific measures? And finally, what are some concrete ways that we can apply the promise physical function to practice? We start with the basics. The promise physical function measure is a self report. Patients respond to questions or items. These items are then used to gain an impression of the patient's perceived abilities. In this case, the functioning of one's upper extremities, lower extremities, central regions, as well as instrumental activities of daily living, such as running errands. Computer adaptive tests are a distinct advantage of promise and other newer measures. A computer adaptive test is a flexible, computer-driven measure that can present a respondent with any item from an item bank. The person using an iPad responds to items selected by the algorithm, typically finding a score in less than a minute. It's selecting the items from over 200 questions or items in the physical function item bank. Having all of these items enables the algorithm to generate scores for both high and low function and provide scores with precision. And this all occurs in less than one minute. So how does the cat find the T-score? It starts with a score near the middle of all of the items. In this case, the person answers that the task is difficult, so the algorithm chooses a task that's physically less demanding than two hours of physical labor. We can see here that the item chosen is vacuuming and yard work, and the iterations continue until the algorithm determines the person's T-score. Let's drill down even a little more to build trust in how these measures determine a score. First, items of varied difficulty are aligned in a hierarchical order along a scale. The responses to each item are associated with a specific region on the scale. For each response, the algorithm looks along the scale to determine the first score. Then with subsequent answers to the specific task, the algorithm iterates until it finds the T-score. What's important is that for any specific T-score, you are getting an initial guess on the level of difficulty of all the items in the item bank. That's 200 tasks, and this is what makes the Promise physical function scale able to detect really low ability as well as really high ability. So now let's do a quick review here of a T-score. A T-score is a person-centered score that is expressed relative to the mean physical function, which equals 50. 10 points is one standard deviation. Floor effects are about three standard deviations lower than 50 or 20. And ceiling effects are about two standard deviations higher than 50 or about 70. Here's an example of data at initial evaluation for physical therapy. All diagnoses are associated with foot and ankle problems. The x-axis are bins of T-scores and the y-axis is frequency. The average physical function is low, about one standard deviation worse than the U.S. average. Also note that the low scores are three standard deviations worse than the U.S. average, and the highest scores, or best scores, are two standard deviations above average. That means the full range of the physical function scale is from about 20 to 70. Here are the same patients at or near discharge. Note that the average is now 45.7 or a half standard deviation worse than normal. The high scores indicate perceived ability to do tasks like running and exercise. The middle scores average of 45 indicates perceived ability to do tasks like walking at 1.3 meters per second. The low scores indicate these patients perceived difficulty with tasks consistent with household ambulation. Let's examine even more granularity associated with the physical function's T-score of 31. T-scores are noted on the y-axis. Here we see three items associated with sit to stand. The blue indicates no difficulty, the red unable to do, 
the orange much difficulty, yellow some difficulty, and green little difficulty. So let's examine a score of 31. All of these sit-to-stand items indicate difficulty in yellow to red, suggesting the person perceives at some difficulty or more with easy and hard sit-to-stand tasks. The first one is sitting up from an armless chair. The second task is sitting up from a low couch. And the third one is to squat and get up. This same T-score is associated with much difficulty or unable to do for most tasks with only walking at a normal speed being within the range of much difficulty. And stare ascent for all the tasks are in the red or they're unable to do. Also notice that the items within the sit to stand, walking, and stare ascent have the step effect, which means that they scale quite nicely, allowing this measure to detect change. We can also look at a higher score that might apply to an athlete. A person with a T-score of 61 perceives sit to stand and walking as not difficult. How are fitness and running items differentiate scores in this range? So that completes our review of basics of the Promise Physical Function Measure. What we've done is review how an algorithm determines a T-score. And we've reviewed T-scores and what their floor and ceiling effects are. So now let's move to motivations. When talking with therapists, I can get a lot of pushback on how a self-report is redundant with physical tests like five times sit to stand or timed up and go. So an important question is, why not just use performance-based tests of physical function? Aren't they more accurate? So let's look at a validation study of ours. We correlated gait speed, shown here on the y-axis, with promise physical function T-scores in community dwelling elderly participants. The correlation supported that people with higher walking speeds also reported higher T-scores with a T-score of 48 associated with a walking speed of 1.24 meters per second, very close to normal. However, if we look at the data more closely, we see the problem clinically. A person with a 48 actually walked at two meters per second and another at one meter per second. People's perceptions of their abilities, even for a task as routine as walking, only partially aligns with actual performance data. Their perceptions of their abilities are also important. This is consistent with lots of published data. Let's look at a sample of some of these here. So here's some data from patients with Parkinson's disease. A discrepancy was found between patients' subjective reporting of ADL and IADL function and objective ratings. Patients overestimated their function on four of five tasks. Here's another one from total joint replacements. Patient perception fails to capture the acute functional declines after TKA and may overstate the long-term functional improvement with surgery. And finally, one more. These results emphasize the importance of including performance measures when tracking recovery after TKA as opposed to solely relying on self-report measures. So the data here is pretty rich. Self-report and ability may or may not align. When you compare their self-report to their measured performance, they may be overly negative, overly positive, or they may match their self-report and ability. This is really the heart of person-centered care, understanding how our physical testing really matches with how the patient feels about how they're doing. Another question is, do these person-centered measures that do not mention anything about a disease or pain detect change? Clearly, this is an important for clinical decisions and reimbursement. Again, here we sample current studies on this topic. Here's a study of the Promise Physical Function Computer Adaptive Algorithm versus the Oswestry Disability Questionnaire and the SF36. The conclusion is the Promise Physical Function CAT outperforms the ODI and SF36 in patients with spine problems. Here's a similar study in patients with foot and ankle problems where they're comparing the promised physical function to the FAM and something called the FFI. The conclusion is, is that the physical function scale of the promise can be a potential replacement for these other PRO measures. 
And finally, a study I performed with my colleagues at the University of Rochester uh, in patients undergoing knee arthroscopy. The global health promised physical function and pain scales showed similar ability to detect change to that of disease-specific measures for patients recovering from knee arthroscopy. So if we go back to our example of the athlete running and look at the items for running, we can see that they scale quite nicely from a lower to higher task. And this provides the promised physical function computer adaptive test with the correct precision to pick up change over time. This results in a minimal clinically important difference or MCID estimated at around five T-score points or a half standard deviation. So the answer then is that the promised physical function computer adaptive tests detect change equally as well or better than current disease specific scales. They are person centered and they provide a reference with few floor and ceiling effects across a wide spectrum of diagnoses. All of this was hard to imagine a few years ago. So we've now reviewed some basics, motivations, and how the promise physical function measure compares to some measures we might be familiar with. So now let's move to clinical application. Once we start using the physical function measure, we'll need to apply it in patient notes and in our own thinking. A basic interpretation of the measure is mild, moderate, and severe categories. Function above 45 is within normal limits. 40 to 45 is mild decrease in physical function. 30 to 40 can be interpreted as moderate limitations in physical function. And then below 30 as severe limitations in physical ability. Let's examine the moderate range of limitations in physical function. This is associated with a T-score of 37.5. The person might be limited quite a lot in walking more than a mile, but have little difficulty or very limited difficulty with making a bed, changing a light bulb, or getting in and out of bed. So now let's listen to a patient in the moderate range of physical limitations and then examine her PROMIS scores. Okay, so tell us a little bit about why you came to physical therapy or why you came to see me. Okay, so I... Um, I injured my knee way back in high school. I'm just going to go way back on my story. I injured my knee way back in high school and had like two surgeries on it. Finally ended up with a total implant. Then my hip got bad. I thought it was my knee, went to a physical therapist, said, no, it's your hip. Ended up doing a hip replacement, a full hip replacement. This hip started really hurting, and I just thought, I don't want to get another hip replacement. <laughs> okay. And I remember that was like one of the first things that you told me too. When we walked into the room, you just like, tell me I don't have to have surgery. Yeah, that, it's just really a big deal to me if I can avoid that. Mm -hmm. So. So what do you think? Were psychosocial issues at play? Let's take a look at the PROMISE scores and see what they say. Physical function, fatigue, and self-efficacy, all about a standard deviation worse than the reference population. We'll talk more about fatigue and self-efficacy in the next module. Notice that social roles for her, though, was equal to the U.S. average. What we're learning is consistently we can detect these other psychosocial issues using the PROMISE scales. Now let's listen some more. So what would you say on that hip? On this one? Yeah. Um, just in the two sessions that we've had? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, you know how I felt in the last session. I actually walked normal for about 10 steps. That I feel like I haven't walked normal in a long time. How about when you did squats at the end of the last session? I know. And you gave me a 20 pound bell or, you know, ball Kettle to do it yeah. with, and I could still do it. Yeah. And I wasn't sore the next day, which still amazes me. That's awesome. Yeah. How much more physical? therapy do you feel like you would need? I would say three to four more sessions. Okay. And why is that? Because I, I think it's going to take time to retrain my brain. Okay. I think a lot of it is in my brain more than, than here. Okay, so now let's look at our PROMISE scores after two treatments. You can see the before treatment and then the follow-up treatment here in green. So we can see that the physical function score is nearly equal to the U.S. mean. Fatigue is the same. Self-efficacy is the same. And then social roles remained uh, 
status quo. What we're learning is that using a psychosocial approach will allow you to calibrate their perceptions of their abilities with their actual performance and help them face off with the challenge of really reactivating them and getting them to participate in social roles. Now let's examine a case of severe physical limitations of score of 27.5. These items indicate that the patient has much difficulty or quite a lot with items associated with community ambulation, but only some difficulty with routine tasks like scissors and getting out of bed. So let's look at the PROMISE scores in a patient that had a myocardial infarction with severe physical limitations. Look at these PROMISE scores, all greater than two standard deviations worse than their reference populations. Remember, the perceptions we just reviewed, a score this low means that walking on flat ground for a block he perceives as much difficult or nearly unable to do. How are you going to get him on a treadmill given these beliefs? In fact, the patient refused to participate in cardiac rehab. The PT had to call the patient to come in at the request of the MD. Here's his measured performance on the first assessment, which included EKG. Let's listen to the patient and the provider. Do you remember our first session? <sighs> Yeah, I remember. Uh, I was asking myself, why did I come here? But uh, but you were uh, very welcoming and enthusiastic, and uh, my performances on the treadmill and bike were just abysmal. Yeah. But you were acting like I was uh, uh, Lance Armstrong, only not on steroids. Uh, and I, I, I kind of bumped me up and made me want to uh, keep doing it. And we all know what happened after. So it sounds like you did a lot. Yep. Um, how did that go, and, and what do you think got him to come back a second time? Like, Yeah, I think it was the fact that I wasn't shocked that he could only walk two minutes on the treadmill. He says, you know, I could tell right away he was discouraged. Mm. And he didn't say it to me, but it was his body language. Yeah. He put his head down, he slumped, he was like breathing really heavy, and he just kind of looked like he was dejected. Mm -hmm. And I said, I said to him, I said, that's a great beginning. And when I just said that, he just was pondering on it like, oh, that wasn't so bad then, huh? And I said, well, it wasn't good, <laughs> right? And he, and he laughed, right? I said, but it wasn't that bad. Because it's, I said, what is bad and good? And I said, this is your baseline. So how did the premise skills help you, you know, kind of target which to work on? So the thing that really popped out with him was that he had low physical function. Mm -hmm. He had low self-efficacy scores. Okay. Right, and that would make sense with what what happened. Right. At that time, we weren't collecting social responsibility, like social roles with him. Right. But where it it, it helped me lead was that I realized that he wasn't doing much. Okay. At home, even before he he told me. Oh, the Cliff's case is challenging. We can see his long term follow up scores here in green compared to his initial scores in white, and there's remarkable improvement. What stands out is his physical performance also reached a five to six met level at discharge. He continues to have mild limitations in physical function and high fatigue, but his self-efficacy score has increased to 50. We'll discuss the fatigue scale and self-efficacy scale in subsequent modules. So what we're learning is that perceived physical ability and measured physical ability don't always agree, and why they don't agree is interesting in terms of motivations, setting dosage, and just treating our patient as a person. So subsequent modules will discuss this interaction of physical function with the other promise scales like self-efficacy, fatigue, and participation in social roles. And hopefully this will come together for you as it did for us in figuring out a more biopsychosocial approach to care. This concludes the Beyond Biopsychosocial Physical Function Measure module.